Hello and welcome to Hardcast. Where just like in this comic, things have changed and aren't quite what they seem. I'm Humphrey Erm, and with me today, filling in for Chris, is... Michael. Lifeline, give me divinity-free Stalinverse. All right, I think introductions are in order. Hello. Yeah, welcome to Hardcast. I'm uh, probably the number one fan. Can I say that? I think so. I mean, at least the lo- longest uh, number one fan in terms of like how uh, how long uh, you, how long you've been a fan. That is maybe that's true. I listened to this podcast for the maybe for the whole length. How many years have you guys done this now? Ooh, that's uh, hard. well, it's not hard to say. I could check. <laughs> but I think we started 2016, so this is coming in on the third year. I have a feeling I may have been with you guys. Almost the whole time. Wow. Maybe out of pure self-indulgence, uh, how did you find us? Oh, I thought you were going to say I listened to it out of pure self-indulgence. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's for my sake. I'm just personally curious. Just, uh, it's pretty fair. I mean, I have a story with Valiant. I found out about Valiant Comics totally by accident. Totally. I wanted to go and buy some dice at the local game store where I live, which is in Germany. At that time, there was no local game store. So I heard that the comic store had some games, like RPGs, old-fashioned role-playing games. And I figured that's a good place to get dice. So I went in there, I got my dice. And so they were giving away these free free games, basically. I picked up a couple of things. And when I got them home, I noticed one of them was this Valiant thing. I thought this was totally crazy. You know, like uh, there's a barbarian guy with an alien suit of uh, armor. And there's a British ninja and more of these ridiculous characters. So I thought, this is great. And it kind of spiraled from there. That's the short version. And yeah, so obviously searching for some podcasts one day, came across uh, this one, among others. Yeah, hooked. Hooked from day one. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's cool. And I just double checked to make sure. And yes, our first episode, at least the one we uploaded to Podbean, was March 1st, uh, March 4th. 2016. 2016. Yeah. And we've been pretty regular until the, the, this last, uh, what's called, hurdle to episode 100. Let's do it. Right. But again, great to have you here. So uh, it's, I think you're probably the, what's called, uh, the most qualified, uh, what's called, person to uh, take over here. Yeah. Well, it's great to be here. I mean, this is just a lot of fun. And um, I always enjoyed your take on things. I always enjoyed Chris's take on things. I'm happy to fill in. All right. And also, uh, what's called, before I start the first issue, uh, what's called, quick some uh, quick shout out to Deferg714. We're finally doing a, an event comic here at Valiant in chronological order. Yep. You ask for it. We'll do it. Almost uh, anything. <laughs> Almost. Issue one. We slowly discover we are in an alternate universe to the Valiant one. One where the Soviet Union reigns supreme with bloodshot dispatching protesters to the regime in California. Peter Stanchek makes defectors drown themselves. An exo man war armed with the Shadow Man, defeating Deadside insurgents. Each is interviewed by Colin King, reinforcing their loyalty to the state. But we realize Colin is seemingly the only person who remembers the real world and is trying to figure out a way to get things back. His only hope, however, is divinity, Abram Adams who refuses to help due to his worry about his wife and kids. It's a lot of story crammed into one issue. But it's like we've often said ourselves, what's called, the first issue has to do so much. Like, especially for a high concept thing. Like, even if you're a diehard Valiant fan, you know, you've read every single book that's come out since the reboot. You need to have a lot lot explained to you in this kind of the Dent comic where, oh, hey, it's a totally alternate universe. So... Did I miss Divinity 1 and 2? Did I miss something that would have set me up for this? Uh, well, yeah, sort of. I remember in... Uh, I don't think so much in Divinity 1, besides the existence of Divinity. Right. But uh, the ending of Divinity 2, I remember, like after the, the, the after um, Abram manages to convince Mishka to not, uh, you know, make everything a uh, communist... Okay. You see, you see her then kind of like hanging out in this little farm where she's, you know, taking, making her own little farm. And oh. there's like this shadow behind her that's like, I have come for you or something like that. 
And that's like the big the end question mark. <laughs> okay. So now we see what really happened. Yeah. Mm. That's cool because we get some flashbacks to all that anyway. Exactly. So, so and, and yes, I have one little point too. Uh, in order to kind of help, because I haven't read this before, like we're, I'm way past the point where I'm rereading stuff. Excellent. And I haven't read the next, like the next half of this. I've only read up to the point that we're supposed to for this episode. Excellent. So I don't, I don't know how it's going to end. I mean, I'm sure things work out in some way, but. Or do they? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, I do still see like advertisements for the newer issues and I don't see any Soviet theme to them. Actually, I mean, there's a question mark for me, but we'll get to that later on. Whether all of the multiple dark things in this book and the tie-ins are really resolved at all. That left me really confused. Oh, OK. Well, we'll see. We'll see what next week then. That's pretty fun. Uh, yeah. Should we say something about this issue? I mean, it's dark. It's pretty heavy stuff. Well, I think it just does a really good job. I mean, I mean, again, you, you can only appreciate this if you are a Valiant fan, because yeah. you're seeing like the differences. Oh, yeah. If you weren't one, you don't understand like what's so interesting about Bloodshot. You know, I mean, he's cool. Yeah. But he, he would just be like, oh, I guess in this Soviet alternate universe, they have this super soldier. Totally. No, and same thing with all the other ones. Like we know, we know Peter Stanchik isn't like the greatest human being, but we do know that you know he's he doesn't want to just make people kill themselves. Oh yeah, but it's clear that you know for us as valiant fans, you know who know these characters and their designs and you know characterizations, it's very like oh what, what's going on here. So I mean, now you put it that way, this might be a little bit of a a bit of an ironic. Thing. I mean, none of the Valiant heroes are, are heroes in the classic sense. None of them is Superman. None of them is even Batman. They're all pretty, like, flawed individuals. Let's put it that way. Mm. So, in a sense, I mean, the lengths that they go to is story-wise. They set up a whole alternate timeline since, oh, let me see, 1922. Although I'm pretty, I don't know, did, did Joseph Stalin assassinate Vladimir Lenin? Yeah, maybe. No, no, no. That's the, that's a big difference. Like, I mean, that's again, the, as, as I've understood it, you know, because of divinities, you know, like uh, reality warping powers. That's the starting point. Yeah. Like, it's not so much that they merely changed things from a certain point. It's more like this key moment. And then thanks to her powers, everything's kind of just been supporting it. Oh, yeah. Right. You're right. So, yeah. So I'm sure. And I think it also makes sense that. So we don't have to make it even more complex by imagining that, you know, that the Soviet Union existed before, like they could have made something where like, you know, before, uh, you know, like, like a BC times, per, for example, somehow setting okay. it up so that it's all Soviets. Yeah, nice and simple, because most comic readers remember a world history back to 1922. That's fine. That's totally fine. Well, yeah, I mean, we go we go to the First World War. That's when history started <laughs> or history lessons start. It seems like a big effort to basically make a bunch of like anti-heroes into really bad guys. I have to say I like it. I mean, I love it. I think it's almost one of the best things that Valiant has done. Totally. Yeah, no, but it, but you're absolutely true. And it's something that we brought up a few times in prior episodes as well. Like, again, it's not that we don't have, you know, like anti-heroes and morally dubious characters in DC and Marvel. Right. But even they're like characters who are, um, you know, like very specific, like the Punisher, who's, you know, it's very specific kind of character they made for this. And uh, sometimes we'll have characters maybe, oh, maybe they had to do this one more morally objectionable thing once. And it scarred them for life. Exactly. But within the Valiant, we have quite a few like uh, kill counts and even our most uh, noble hero. Did you notice a couple of things? Can I can I point out the fun stuff? Sure, of course. I mean, fun by Valiant standards. <laughs> so I loved it on page. Oh, OK, I don't have the page numbers. But near the start, when Bloodshot's coming back, he uh, he says the tactics they use were surprising. And there's an ex there's a huge explosion and you see nails and broken glass flying around. The outcome was predictable on the next page. And you see him standing there and being Bloodshot. He's uh, his obviously his head is like peppered with these nails and things. And he just says predictable. That was a nice bloodshot moment, I thought. 
Oh, yeah. But again, that is the thing you can do with a character like Bloodshot, kind of like with Wolverine and stuff like that. You know, you, you, should, you have to take advantage of having a character you can just, you know, destroy without any repercussions. I mean, just consider, like, he even sees the tripwire. You know, it's not like he's, like, he got tricked. He's, like, he sees it. Huh, that's weird. Oh, well, let's just activate it. Better check. Yeah, I mean, because he knew he wouldn't do anything. And, again, that's the fun part with a character like that. So, but, yeah, no, I mean, it's just the whole... I mean, it just sets up the whole big thing here. So the, the only characters we don't really have uh, get to see, maybe we get to see them in the tie-in books or in the next two issues or free issues. The main Valiant characters? Yeah, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm just curious, for example, like with Archer and Armstrong and Eternal Warrior. Yeah, you, you'll you get to see what happened. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, don't tell me then. Uh, so, But it's one of those things like, like I, I'm fine with them not being centerpiece here, but I'm just kind of curious myself in terms of, um, well, you know, like, okay, so, you know, how were they affected? Like, what's the Soviet version of these guys? Oh, yeah, totally. So I guess Armstrong wouldn't be too different. He's totally different. Oh, <laughs> I'm guessing it's just he drinks more vodka now. Right. <laughs> oh, no, you're going to love that. But we got to get to that next episode, I believe. All right, then. Yes. A uh, quick shout out to Colin King with his one pound coin. It apparently triggers his memory of an entirely different timeline. <laughs> Which is also kind of odd then when you think about it in terms of like, how was this coin? Um, like, why was this not touched or? Right. Yeah. Why just one pound? There's a one pound coin. But again, maybe it's explained. I mean, because that's a that's the interesting thing that you well, it's both the good and bad with like how divinity's powers work. Because I remember when we were reading the first divinity, and then again with the second. Okay, it's just still kind of tricky to understand the full sense of like, okay, so are they literally changing the material world, or is it the perception of it? Ooh, like because I remember. I remember the question was brought up in the first one because he lands in Australia and then all he like amasses this cult. Right. But it was all, always sort of in this region, this area, and not specifically like everything changing. And I can't remember if there was a character who, like there was a character who became like a bird because that's what he really wanted to be. <laughs> but I can't remember if he remained a bird after like Divinity then was quote, quote unquote captured. You know what I mean? Like, is it like, I, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where when you have these unlimited powers, it gets very, like, confusing. Yeah, and I have to warn you, it gets more confusing as we go to the end of this event. So strap yourself in. Am I am I right in saying that this is the same artist as Britannia? No, no. No, no Britannia is, I forget his name, but it's the artist for, um, uh, for the tie-in books. Oh, you're right. Okay. So yeah, I forget his is... name. We'll see when I arrive. Okay. No, but this is a this is a beautiful book. Yeah, Trevor Hairsign or Hair Hairson. Right. Thanks, he's he's done a few he's done a few other books for Valiant. Thank you, Trevor. It's nice. It's yeah, no, but it's good stuff. It's good stuff. It's very um how do you say? Well it's just very solid. Like, you know, you get the seriousness of the situation. It's not too like glossy. It's really clean and crisp, but there's something uh there's something stylized about it. The way he draws like people's jackets and I don't know, always gives people like this uh heads are a little bit too small for the body or something. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's perspective. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's cool. It seems to fit with the the style of uh of Valiant, really, I would say. Yeah, I mean again, you know, it's they have so many different artists working on their books, so you know it's hard to have like a unified style. It's kind of the reason why me and Chris each time when we have like a Harbinger book with Peter. Yeah, totally. And he's always like, he's he's the worst designed character in, in the Valiant universe because you can never tell it's him. Yeah, who is this guy? Oh, it's Peter again. Great. Yeah, he's so generic. Like there's nothing, you know, like not even yeah, something like exactly. a scar or something. Yeah, he's a kid. Yeah, 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 some like a late teen guy, and it's like, okay, I mean, that's fine, but he, he needs something. Like, so the moment a different artist draws him, you don't know who it is. Well, in like, this one, they give him more of a, like, a, a long coat and stuff, and he looks pretty cool. Oh, yeah. But speaking <laughs> of things about immediately recognizing people, uh, color schemes. That page with uh, Colin walking through the snow to his apartment, purple oh, yeah. scarf, and immediately, well, that's Ninjak, of course. 
I mean, that's immediately like, you know, there's nothing odd about the way he dresses, but the color scheme, as simple as it is, immediately tells you, well, right, it's Ninjak. Wasn't his first, uh, Ninjak's first mission to assassinate the lady with the purple scarf? Or was it a pink scarf? Right, right. I was, I was trying to remember like, oh, which one was that? But that was the, it was the um, prequel stuff in the side, the side story. Oh, that was the Ninja Files? Exactly. Right. The, um, the page before he's wearing the purple scarf, did you see him pop the red pill? I did, but I wasn't quite un entirely understanding what that was. Is that an, actually a pill or is he transporting something? I have no idea. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe we're going to see, but maybe not. Hey, let's look out for it anyway. That's weird. Yeah, I mean, it's very obvious that he's doing it, but I just wasn't sure because... Like I'm getting, of course, that he's writing, um, you know, here he's writing to his uh, superiors. So it's all about, yeah, everything's fine. You know, everyone believes in the Communist Party. And then was he writes like his a, true story, his true thoughts later. Right. Was it like a, was it like a nod to the Matrix or what? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm wondering now that you mentioned it, because it hasn't really been brought up. But what could that be then? Like, is he, does he know what kind of drugs will help him keep his mind clear? That's what I was thinking. Well, I mean, maybe we'll find out. It's it's too obvious of a thing to not be brought up again, especially since they don't actually say what it is. Oh, this is valiant. It could easily be thrown in and then it comes up in another couple of years. Ah, well, I mean, this is from... Uh, actually, I forget. When is this book from? Ah, uh, good question. Is it is it 2018 or is it 2017? Wow. Because I'm, I'm pretty far behind. I, I got to start to get back into it. This is 2016. No, no, no. Because we've started, the, we started making our podcast in 2016. This one says 2016, man. No, really? <laughs> you guys were pretty far behind. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, excusing the fact that it's, you know, January in 2019. So it's not like it's a whole year past yet, but really? Oh, wow. Yeah, we're really behind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the trade came out in 2017. The trade came out in 2017. Okay. But still, yeah, the, the story itself came out before then. Oh, wow. <laughs> Are you All ready right? for some... Oh, ready for some glorious heroes? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the yes, quick summary in terms of here. It's, again, it's just a great start. As for me, like, yes, kind of getting into it, not knowing what's going to happen. It's just really exciting. I'm genuinely curious about the fate of all these other heroes, how they are different. And as we're going to see then in the, this next part, these new characters they showed on the TV, the different, the Red Brigade. I mean, that's just like immediately like, oh, okay, cool. New characters. I'm curious. Yeah. So in the background of the, the TV that Colin sees in the psychiatric ward, you get a glimpse of tall Amazon lady holding a bird of some kind, a hawk or something. You see a skeleton wearing a metal helmet, a little tiny bug-like creature, and some some person with a staff. I'm not totally sure who that is. Oh yeah, okay. So there's a there's a classic villain there's a classic villain team up going on here. Exactly. And we're gonna cut to the glorious heroes of the Stalinverse to find out who they are. So issue number one is Commander Bloodshot. This is Commander written in that kind of almost Russian script and it's Commander with an A. Just to remind you that he's really now Super Rasputin bloodshot. So, deep in the wintry Siberian wastes, a Soviet Project Rising Spirit prepares Commandar bloodshot to be launched into Colorado via ICBM. His mission to wipe out a cell of terrorists, that's in air quotes, resisting the Soviets for Mother Russia. We see him emerge from the missile, presumably in the Rockies, looking like a buff Rasputin, with an enormous axe and the usual selection of guns. So there's a little continuity. Agents Festival and Hoyt take a few pot shots at him, and this just makes him mad. Festival lures Bloodshot back to a base where Kozol, a resistance leader in this timeline, assures her that there's a surprise waiting for him. On the way, Bloodshot is ambushed by Rampage, who yells anti-commie trash talk, but then gets killed anyway. Bloodshot strolls into the atmospheric, creepy secret base, Doors slam and Livewire tries to hack his nanites, but fails. Fails means she dies. Bloodshot powers up his nanite axe and flings it around, slaughtering everyone except magic. Cut to the real timeline, which apparently... Or is it the real timeline? Apparently Bloodshot partly remembers it because he lets magic live. Because he loves her. As Bloodshot debriefs, concealing magic's escape, we see her stumble out into the winter night. 
Uh, first of all, really nicely summarized, like very on point without going overbearing, but also genuinely kind of like in my head, I was seeing it all like, wow, yeah, you're hitting every beat. Perfect. Oh, thanks, man. Well, I had, you know, I had some good, had some good examples <laughs> to follow. But yeah, this, this was really fun. I mean, first of all, Clayton Crane as the artist, you know, the, the Rye guy. Oh, yeah, now it makes sense. And he did one, uh, he did maybe one or two issues of um, Harbinger Wars too. Could that be right? I think he did portions of them. Like he did a lot of flashbacks of Gen Zero. Right. Like he also did a flashback for the um, uh, Eternal Emperor, I remember. Well, not the Eternal Emperor, but the first volume, like the Swords and Something, like of Eternal right. Warrior. Okay. He did, yeah, he did like the Wild West flashback. I need to catch up on this stuff. Yeah, and that's an old one. Like that's that was the first uh, solo Eternal Warrior comic. This is uh, awesome art. It's perfect. And there's just something like with the you know when he's just uh, wandering through the forest in the beginning. Right. An almost silent page except for the little sound effect and that bunny. I wanted to put something in my summary about Bloodshot gets scared by a bunny rabbit. <laughs> Missed opportunity. No, it's probably not, not the most important, but it kind of it's kind of nice though because it illustrates that he's not he's obviously merciless, but he's not he doesn't go beyond what he has to or like what he's ordered to. <laughs> no, but you know, like I mean, sure, there's a tactical reason not to shoot the bunny. It would make people, uh, you know, it, it would make the terrorists aware of him. But still, you know, they could have had that as a moment to just show how evil he is. But nope, he let it go. I think there's plenty of opportunities later on in this issue to show just how evil he is. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for me, it was more of a classic Valiant moment where they just don't take anything seriously. So on this page, he's like, he's being scared by the bunny. On the next page, he's being machine gunned. That's, yeah, that's pretty much a standard, that's pretty much a standard Valiant beat there. Oh, definitely. And then just having a bloodshot grabbing Hoyt and slamming his head into a tree. Right. Uh, her head, by the way. Oh, no, you're right. Uh, sorry. No, no, Festival survives a little bit longer. That's Festival. That's Hoyt. Because I've missed out on that Eternal uh, Warrior um, run. And also no, no, Bloodshot Reborn. And I missed out on Bloodshot Reborn. Those are two big ones that I you know, just totally skipped. Oh, OK. Yeah, no, they, no, they made their appearances in Bloodshot Reborn. So they were the two FBI agents trying to find him in the first two volumes. Yeah. And I love the way that it's all like, wow, this is eerily similar, but strangely different. Exactly. Yeah. Of course, it has to be in Colorado. Oh, oh holy. Oh, oh wow. I, I didn't even think of that connection, but you're right. <laughs> I was just thinking like, oh, well, it has to be in America, of course, because that's where, you know, the resistance would be and the Colorado mountains make sense. But you're right. I didn't even think about like that the first volume of Reborn was even called Colorado. <laughs> wow, it's so obvious and I didn't think of it. So for Valiant readers like me, this is yet another great example, just how good Valiant used to be. Yeah, I'm, again, you know, I'm, I'm kind of behind, so we'll see if I notice that the um, transitional period. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> It'll be a while, but... Um, yeah, yeah, you can spot it. But I'm curious, um, though, since you, since I know that you're very like on point with uh, knowing a lot of stuff, is Rampage anything that I'm uh, missing? Or yeah, Rampage is this weird character. I'm not totally sure the full story, but for sure he's in the Book of Death, I believe. Was he? And and then he only appears later, as far as I know, in the latest Bloodshot. That just came out, just finished the Bloodshot Salvation. Ah, okay. And that's where you see his origin. Okay, because, yeah, I, I, I was trying to think when I saw him, I'm kind of like, huh, who's this, you know, who's <laughs> this alternate universe version of? Right. It's uh, the alternate version of Rampage, which is basically just the same as Rampage. But who's Rampage? So, I can't remember him at all. He's a big, tough, badass guy. So for, from this current run, from the, like, 2012 reboot? Yeah, he was in Book of Death. I can't remember anything from there. Like, it's, so it's from one of those future depictions then. Right. He gets about one panel, I would say. He, uh, he pops up. He's fighting Armstrong as a pirate Armstrong. Oh, I remember. Yeah, I remember the pirate Armstrong stuff. 
Oh, okay. So that's really that's that's way way foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's just crazy. I I can only assume that Rampage is some old '90s Valiant character, maybe who they thought they just had to bring back. No idea. Yeah, I mean, again, it would be cool. I mean, it's and he's fine, even if even though he's just like fodder for Bloodshot. I'm still kind of like because you know, whenever there's a very specific design and name and stuff shown, I always kind of wonder. Okay, there's obviously some importance here, right? I think that's kind of the point. Like all of the big characters in Valiant just turn up and get cut down. So Kozol just bites the dust, and uh, Livewire, apparently in this universe. Soviet nanites are tougher than American nanites? I don't know. Well, it didn't seem like they're tougher. It's just they had a failsafe. They had a failsafe. That was a good idea, the failsafe. That's actually, and that's one of the things I was mentioning before. I'm getting the feeling that, because I don't know, reading through these two issues and the other two from the uh, tie-ins. Right. They are like super competent, the Soviets. And I'm wondering, like, if that's merely because of divinity. Like, somehow it's not so much that they're, like, you know, having a specific hand, but somehow maybe their powers, it's not like it's like a godly intervention, you know, like, it's like, you know, a god themselves would, like, come down and, you know, stop something happening. Yeah. But, but more like they're making all circumstances, like, uh, they're all, they all lean towards the Soviets. I think you can put it down to the fact that they conquered the whole world. I think that pretty much sums it up for me. And uh, in this timeline, you know, they, they conquered the whole world, pretty much. And uh, PRS is now working for the Soviets. So they have everything uh, that PRS had, I guess. Like Rampage is just this poor facsimile of Bloodshot. He's not even nanite based. Yeah. Yeah. They just stole all the tech. Yeah, no, you're right. I didn't consider that. But you're right. That's, I mean, regardless of, you know, their ruthlessness, they obviously have resources if they own the whole world. Yeah, they pretty much, they took over Europe and the Americas. I think that's that's what happens, right? Yeah, and the Asias too, I think, from what I was and seeing. The in the, yeah, okay. like from what I was seeing in the timeline that they made. Like okay, it was so the war for Asia they mentioned. Right. Okay, yeah, you're right. Okay. They drop a bomb on Tokyo in 1949. That that covers much of the world. I like the fact that in the Battle of Britain, England, Scotland, and Ireland fell under Soviet rule, according to this. So Wales is fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not even the Soviets want to mess with Wales. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can just see, I mean, yeah. Wales didn't make much of an appearance in Valiant Comics as, as of now. <laughs> not yet, but we can only hope. But the last thing I wanted to mention, yes, um, I mean, it's been a, such a cool issue, this, like, really good tie-in. Yeah. But I just love that, you know, it's such a different character, Kosal, in this version. Right. I mean, that's that's a, a two-page spread when uh, when uh, Bloodshot's just slaughtering everyone. Right. Like, original Kosal would never be, get behind me, magic. Yeah, the opposite, right? Yeah, I mean, such a selfless act, and then it's like, get behind me, magic. It's like, oh god, like, like this version of Kosal is actually heroic. Yeah, this is a bizarre issue, actually. <laughs> like, that's the that's the weirdest thing. Like, everything else is like fine, but Kosal being like good. <laughs> yeah, compared to the one in uh, the way he acts in Archer and Armstrong, he's basically a he's a complete coward. Yeah, he's a self serving coward. All right, but then the backup story, uh, if, if you if you would like. Oh, I would. And now, the bonus. <laughs> so, the origin of the Red Legend. A creepy, feral child wanders upriver from a huge fire on the horizon to a Soviet labor camp where she's adopted by a widow. Her new mother distracts her from their hard labor with folk tales of a caged bird who mirrors their captive existence. One day, a prison guard gets too fresh with Nina, that's the, that's the now-grown orphan girl, and she punches him 40 feet across the camp. Turns out she's super fast, as strong as she is motivated to be. And one day, Mishka arrives to give her a mission from the motherland. She agrees to join the Red Brigade in return for opening up the camp. And thus is born Valiant's commie Wonder Woman. I wasn't even thinking about... I'm not sure if it's entirely like in terms of origin story or anything, but visually, you're right. It's very Wonder Woman. <laughs> no, she's, she's, she's not really Wonder Woman, but... Uh, 
when you see the final page, this kind of pinup style, she's got this white eagle floating there. She's got a shield kind of wearing this Amazon style armor there. Yeah. And that's her superpowers. She's basically just like a super badass. Yeah. And that's, and again, that's all you need sometimes, you know, it, it's fun to have creative new powers and stuff like that, but totally. you know, superhuman strength that you can get, do so much with that. This is uh, art by Rip, right? This is yeah. Juan Jose Rip. Exactly. Yeah. Just awesome. I like, love his art. All of these, like all of the faces kind of look the same. He does like three expressions, right? Yeah. But that's because he spends all his time rendering everything. <laughs> it's like, yeah. like, as I've mentioned before, cause he really does good work when it's about like, for example, the wrath of the eternal warrior during the uh, flashback story. So when the, our, uh, when the Gilad's son was kidnapped, like he drew that and that's like, He's so perfect for drawing awful, ugly, like hairy barbarians slaughtering everyone. Totally. And the three expressions that he can do, which are shocked, terror, and just like disgruntled anger. <laughs> and uh, wait a minute, that's pretty much it, actually. I think someone may, might, might be smiling on one of these pages, but I'm not totally convinced. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I don't know. I've always been a big fan of him. So especially from, again, I've read a little bit of Britannia and I think he does a good work uh, there too. Oh yeah. Yeah, it totally fits Britannia too. And this this is another story, which is like a tie-in story, but it covers this whole life of this person, apparently. And it, cov it covers like her, uh, her whole childhood and her growing up in like five pages, right? Just this awesome like historical stuff is in there. There's folk tales in there. There's a weird kind of Wonder Woman tie in there. Yeah, this is incredible. Yeah, but that's something that's something I've said for a long time, both on the podcast and just uh, like uh, what's called in real life too. Right. I miss this compressed storytelling. Like people want to drag things out so much now, you know, like every superhero movie has to start with an origin story. You have to spend the whole movie just, you know, the, they only took, get their costume until like the last 30 minutes or something. Well, like, there's like a... There's like a whole movie's worth of material in this. I mean, okay, maybe not a great movie, but... Oh, yeah, certainly. You know, you, you can add, definitely add stuff to it if you want to. But in terms of like, here, here's your superhero. That's like, cool. I, I'm, I'm, I'm down. I'm down. I want to see her adventures now. Right. Yeah. I'm on board with this. Yeah. And I wish I wish they'd be more like that sometimes. Like, yes, shorter, more well-crafted, complete stories. Yeah. All right. But then let's move on to issue two of Divinity Free. Please do. We start off on Mars, where Divinity 2, Mishka, and other Soviet heroes are constructing something, only to be called back to Earth. Colin sets up a trap where he flies to Antarctica as Ninjak to meet Bloodshot, where he, with surgical precision, neutralizes him and cuts off his head. Bringing it back to Moscow, he meets Toyo Harada in his apartment, who apparently is also aware of the real world and has been leading the insurgents around the world. Colin hopes that the old world internet that is saved in Bloodshot's brain can wake Divinity up. So once it's all on his phone, both he and Harada go to him in order to enact the plan. Meanwhile, Mishka is berated by President Putin for allowing these insurgents to exist. And we find out that the deferred cosmonaut, Kasmir, is inside of her. And now her and, now her and her um, other Soviet heroes will kill off the resistance and Divinity once and for all. Or will they? Again, I'm assuming so, but you know, it's, I'd, I'd be very shocked to see you. So, as we all know, the internet will save the world. <laughs> mm, well, I'm, I'm hoping that he gets to read all the, you know, history amongst all the cat videos. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, okay, this, this, so this bloodshot has the entire internet in his head, but he never, he never bothers to like look it up and say, oh, wait a minute. Well, I'm guessing there was like, you know, like a parental filter on it or something. It takes, yeah. It's... So no, no, those are no, no sites, Bloodshot. That's true. Yeah. He just sees a big red redacted across the whole. Yes. That's true. No, I am a little confused myself. I mean, again, okay. maybe it will be explained. Okay. But... What's confusing you? Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's just kind of, but in some ways it can make sense because as we kind of hear now with like Toyo Harada also being immune. Okay. I'm kind of thinking the idea as he mentions that Colin might just 
be too cool, like, you know, with his meditation and stuff. Yeah, Colin, yeah, Colin is just a total badass. Mm. But I mean, with Harada, I can kind of understand. I mean, if, if you're the world's most powerful psychic, I kind of can buy the idea that he could, you know, maybe be immune or at least be able to block it. Yeah, Harada is the, uh, well, Harada possesses the Harada mind. So he's, um, he's basically some kind of cosmic entity, you know, just happens to look like a middle-aged Japanese dude. Exactly. Um, yeah, he's going to turn into this psychedelic energy thing at the end of the at the end of the Valiant universe, right? So he, he pretty much just has a plot immunity. Well, like um, all characters who showed up in the tie-ins to, to Book of Death. I don't know. I mean, I think Colin dies pretty pretty convincingly at the, at the end, and uh, Bloodshot dies for sure. Yeah, but then they kind of have that, um, as they showed in uh, uh, 4001 AD, uh, the, the tie-ins. You know, then we kind of get a new Bloodshot who's just nanites. Yeah, one step at a time, okay? Yeah, no, but I'm, I'm fine. That's like, that's like an okay cop-out, I feel, because it's not, you know, Ray. Yeah, totally. And it's a totally different setting, too, you know? So it's not like it's... Don't worry, magic. And I know it looked like your husband died, but no, it's okay. Here he is. <laughs> you know? So here we have uh, the big twist, the the only big bad of the Valiant universe, Toyo Harada. Is is the last is the only hope actually to to save this world? There you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, he even brings that up too. Uh, Colin, you know, kind of um, makes a snide remark about it. Like, how does he say it? I yeah. thought you would approve of this communist utopia, everyone sharing in misery equally. <laughs> and that, again, that's what I find interesting with Toyo. I mean, he's one of my favorite characters in the Valiant Universe, just because you know, yes, he is a villain. And he does so many bad things, but he genuinely, like, it's very self-serving, but in the end, it would be a very beautiful world if people could get along and kind of just follow his ideas. <laughs> no, but, you know, in terms of like, yeah, again, because it's not like he wants to sit there and rule with an iron fist. Right. Just, but, uh... but he does it anyways. He, like, he does it because he doesn't understand that that's, you know, that's what happens. I'm, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to enjoy it. <laughs> Why did you make me hurt you? Yeah. I, again, I'm not saying, you know, it's again, it's not like, oh, yeah, he was right all along. It's just it's just what makes him and Valiant in general so interesting. Yeah, he's also like uh, he's an awesome version of the old 90s Toyo Harada, who was just this uh, rich uh, businessman with a big yacht. Mm, yeah, I've read I uh, read a bit of that. I've read some of like the original Valiant. No, but here again, they, uh, Harada and Colin are rocking the red scarves. Very important to color coordinate there with the Divine Army. I guess they got the red scarves as well. So, oh yeah, that, damn, it's it's funny because you know, uh, it, it's funny. Like you, I remember you were mentioning to me that I I would make more of the art mentions. Oh uh, yeah, but you're the one noticing a lot more. Again, very obvious imagery. <laughs> like I think I was just thinking more like, okay, well, it's undercover because you know, you know, the Soviets are red. Right. So, so I was thinking more like, okay, yeah, so it's just red now, but no, but yeah, it's foreshadowing. Well, not foreshadowing, but it's, um, well, what do you say? Well, it's just a theme. It's just a thematic coloring, as you said. Yeah, it's like a nice, it's keyed in. Ah, man. But yeah, it's, and again, I, I love stuff like that in any movie and stuff too, you know, when it's like, oh my God, that's so clever. Like you don't okay, think about it, but you feel it. You said you only read up to this part, right? Yeah, yeah, I don't know what happens after this. Like, I just see um, Abrams' eye light up. Okay, yeah. And then yeah, and then we have Putin, you know, mad at Mishka. And did you see, when you see Abrams drawing or whatever in the, in the hospital, what did, you, what did you make of that? Oh, well, I mean, earlier on we see him do it. Um, like, is, yeah, he making, he's, you know, is he making a comic book? I don't know. I mean, they mention what's called like a common mentions that he smuggled these to him <laughs> and they're like, they're subliminal coloring books. Like on the surface, they look fine. Right. But they have pictures of Ninjak and uh, there's a, there's an obvious picture of divinity right there. And the... yeah, it's kind of odd there. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I kind of want to think that those drawings aren't actually in the coloring book. It's more of his brain, like that's what he's seeing with a color coloring book filter. 
Because I'm pretty sure after, you know, after he gives those books uh, to him, you know, and they inspected them, I'm pretty sure they would have looked at that and be like, hmm, this looks suspicious. Yeah, it's like, wait a minute. Now that I color this in, I can see that it's the real timeline. And it, look, it even has captions. Exactly. I really want to buy, I really want Valiant to, to produce this coloring book now. Oh, I, I wish Valiant was big enough where they could do that. <laughs> Right. No, but like just, that would be such. That would be, uh, yeah, that would be the number one tie in I would wish for this year. <laughs> yeah, but just one of those fun things, you know? Like, I love it when people can produce these bonus things. You know, um, like, did, did, have you ever read any of Terry Pratchett's books? You know, Discworld? Oh, yeah, pretty much everything. Ah, okay. The, you, know, you know how he, in the books, he had this like children's book called Where's My Cow? <laughs> And he right. actually made an actual children's book called Where's My Cow? That's actually for kids. Yeah, pretty much everybody's doing that these days. Mm. Um, but that might have been the first. Yeah, but again, you're right, though. That would be so much fun having an actual coloring book. <laughs> again, yes, you know, like, ah, oh, man, I want that now. <laughs> yes, color my secret memories. And the last thing I'd just like to say, then, it's uh, even though it's like very one sided, it's a pretty cool fight between Ninjak and Bloodshot. Yeah, uh, dude, it's like the ultimate. Uh, Bloodshot never gets owned like this. He gets blown to pieces quite a lot, but it's pretty unusual that someone just takes him on head to head and wins. And that's it. He's, he's gone out. No, I agree. So, but again, it's one of those things where it's kind of like that Batman thing, you know, people always call it the prep time. Yeah. And it does make sense for Bloodshot that that's kind of his bigger weakness, like being, um, what's the word, uh, being amputated. Because like gun wounds, I'd imagine would heal relatively quick because sure, you know, they just went through his whole body, but the right. distance between the cells to regenerate isn't that big. <laughs> Now he has to like grow entirely new bones and muscles, you know, from his arms. Yeah. I mean, in case that makes too much sense, also cooling him down probably ought to make him faster, shouldn't it? Maybe? You but mean like in terms of like a machinery, like, you know, because machines overheat? Yeah. I thought that generally like computers work a little bit better at a low temperature, but okay, whatever. I'll give you that. I guess they could also be a bit too, um, I mean, the nanites are, again, practically magical in some way. They kind of do what they need to do whenever they, whatever they have to do. Oh, yeah. No, it, I mean, it kind of makes sense. I mean, they have to work to keep them warm. And, uh, you know, they, they have chemical reactions or whatever. So actually, maybe. <laughs> it's but again, comic book. It makes sense. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's what I always love with these kinds of superhero comic stuff. It's just those kinds of discussions because it's always so but wait a minute how does that work and well, yeah. what about this and in that issue then there wasn't a problem and yeah don't like, think too much <laughs> the, the answer is never oh it was an oversight that's never the answer <laughs> like it's, it's never like oh yes ignore that time because that was you know or oh well we made a mistake we'll try to ignore it for the next one or okay you're gonna love what happens in the next uh, in the new quantum on woody then Oh, yeah, there's new Quantum Woody, too. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> so behind. <laughs> I, hope there's I, a, I, I, I know didn't... I missed a sale recently, so I'm hoping there's a sale soon so I can just kind of catch up. I wish I could just uh, head over and lend it to you, but it's kind of a long way. <laughs> <laughs> ah, next time. Next time. All right, so let's see here then what happens in, the, you know, the next side story. Back in the main storyline, actually, as it were... Soviet reality, the, the Soviets pick up a strange signal originating in space and terminating in Rome. Krakum. Yes, uh, Exo Man of War is back from outer space, where he's been exactly not totally sure. What's important is that he's an alien barbarian, and the Soviets, um, again, mysteriously seem to be able to handle that. Having overpowered the unstoppable armor that Exo wears, he realizes he's been weak and immediately becomes a paid-up communist. Cut to a few years later, there's a triumphal parade, couple of uh, political references, 
and we realized that the the dead side is fighting against Soviet Russia. Exo Man of War is the figurehead for this, and the huge uh, military parade is going to be sacrificed just to get Exo into the dead side, where he confronts Master Dark and his legions of uh, disenfranchised uh, dead people, I guess, before delivering a quick speech about how Exo's real politique, which he just discovered apparently, is superior, and he blows the crap out of them all before escaping from the dead side, where he returns to his collective farm. Everything's totally fine now because Exo gets to till the land and live in peace with his wife and kid in the gulag. Yeah. Ah, that was well summarized. <laughs> Thank you. But I think I the know. thing is, no, but I think the thing is because, you know, from the timeline that they show in the volume. Yeah. That 1922 is the time where things like changed. I Ooh. think this is the original Arik, like when he lands. This is the first time he lands, right? Yeah, like I think this is basically, you know, the first volume of, um, or like the first uh, two issues or so of the um, of, uh, Exo Man of War happen exactly the same way. Right. You know, like the Vine kidnap him. He's, you know, he's for years in the spaceship, you know, tending the farm there steals the Exo Man of War suit and lands in Rome. Only now, instead of being, you know, Rome as we know it, it's, you know, Soviet Rome. Oh yeah, check it out. There's hammers and sickles on the Colosseum. You gotta make sure, you, we can't let the people forget. <laughs> Just in case you didn't realize. Because uh, you, you tend to forget as a citizen in, a Soviet, uh, in the Soviet Union, you forget like, oh, wait, are we Soviets or not? Oh yeah, yes, yes, we are. Definitely, yeah. But I guess it's a propaganda. I mean, you have to reinforce the idea all the time. Like advertisement. No, there's no connection there at all. <laughs> but uh, I don't you know. You have to remember Coke, even though we all know about Coca-Cola, but they have to always make sure we never forget. Was this the Arik we know and love? When he lands, yes. But then after he's defeated, he um, gets brainwashed. Yeah, this was a shame, yeah. But he uh, he basically turns into the real, the real bona fide communist there. And I mean, he's happy. He gets his farm. That's what he loves to do. Uh, he'd much rather be, you know, growing potatoes or whatever than kicking ass. That's just his, uh, that's just what he does. You know, that's his day job. Absolutely. But, and here comes, you know, like the kind of superhero nitpick thing. Uh, how does uh, Shanhara change its form like that? <laughs> Like, I mean, I get it, you know, that it's now to signify he's a different character and, you know, he's a propaganda piece. But how does Shanhara, who is a living armor, how did that one change? From blue to red. <laughs> yeah, and, and shape-wise, too. I mean, you know, you can see on his helmet it's different. He has that little, like, thing in the middle and with text. <laughs> Yeah, that's so you can you can remember that it's a communist Shanhara. Yeah, but again, like how, like again, it's not, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, especially for a tie-in story for an alternate universe. But it's those little things that, you know, because, you know, we've read so much and we care so much, we're kind of sitting there being like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I was more impressed by the fact that Master Dark is now the good guy. I mean, sorry, he, he's the real bad guy, right? Not, not even Harada, really. Harada's just misunderstood. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Harada's at least, um, sure, he's a Saiyan, but, you know, he's still human. Like, Master Dark is sort of, um, like, uh, cartoonishly evil. You know, I mean, yes, the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's the dark force. Mm. He wears yeah, and, with, and, and misspelled, too, so it's cool. He has, uh, he, he has shoulder pads. Exactly. It's, uh, yeah, this is a pretty powerful image, I thought, actually. You know, he has this legion of the dead. There's too many people dying, and uh, it's not fair. So they're going to fight back. Yeah, but it is kind of an odd concept. Like, because again, yeah. so what is Arik doing here? Is he killing the dead? Yeah, apparently he's like, blown Where up. do they go? <laughs> yeah, let's not get into valiant metaphysics, because that's just going to go nowhere. Mm. I mean, again, I mean, I guess that question would have been there ever since Shadow Man. So it's not like it's a new thing. 
Oh yeah. But it is kind of like when you're looking at it and kind of, um, <laughs> I mean, this, this, this might be an odd one, but you know, since you're in Germany, you probably might have read it. Um, uh -huh. did, did you ever, did you ever read, um, Astrid Lindgren's, uh, the brothers of Lionheart? No. So, but That's you know, Astrid Lindgren. Yeah. Right, Pippi Longstocking. Exactly. She, she wrote a fantasy novel called The Brothers Lionheart. Really? Yeah, and there basically what happens is uh, these two brothers from our world, uh, okay. spoilers, but it's the first chapter, so. Okay. Uh, they, they die, and they wake up in this fantasy world called Nangiala, which is sort of the in-between heaven and uh, life. Perfect. Okay. You have to kind of live your life again in this place. And when you die there, you go to the true heaven. <laughs> and I, I know that's kind of an odd thing to bring up in Valiant, you know, like the Pippi Longstocking writer's book. No kidding. But I, had no I was idea. thinking like, is there another world after that? Or <laughs> it's like, oh, well done. Now you get to go to level three. <laughs> <laughs> this, I, I mean, that's still better than most fantasy novel setups, to be really honest. You know, at least it kind of has a bit of logic to it, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, it's been ages since I read it or watched the movie, but... Uh, I'll check it out. Well, again, I, you know, it's, it's a children's book, uh, so I'm not sure how advanced it is, but it's, it's, it's a classic, Swedish classic. That's, that counts as a kid's book in, in Sweden, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> two, two brothers die. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like come the on. Mr. Harry Potter's a kid's book, and it starts with, you know, uh, it starts with an orphan. Yeah, okay, fair, fair. So, yeah, <laughs> things, things were dark, and now they get darker. And there's an actual guy called Dark. Yes. <laughs> Again, the roles are reversed. Uh, Master Dark is the bad guy, and he's now fighting for the oppressed. And that's, that's Arik's job. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think of the art and all that stuff? Oh, it's fine. So, it's... Um... <laughs> No, but I mean, it's, that's the thing. Usually, usually I comment if it's like really atrocious or if it's like really good. Uh, like here, it's just very solid. I mean, everything looks the way it should, like nothing odd or confusing. I mean, the one thing, oh, this is coming up in the next episode, but there's already a spectacular battle. I mean, they fight a few dead side creatures. There's some creepy stuff with dead side. Monsters exploding out of the ground and people and stuff like this, where they uh, the Soviets like crassly sacrifice apparently like a bunch of soldiers to get into the dead side. I'm not sure about that. I think that's just about um, you know that's just like the people they kill normally, and it's just to show like that they're all falling down to the dead side. Yeah. All right, and then we have another new hero. Oh yeah. Okay, here it comes. Okay, so this is Kosti the Deathless. It's 1628, and a Russian uh, general is doing his thing, taking over the wastelands of Siberia, discovers a mysterious asteroid that the nomads were hiding, and of course just walks up and touches it. Cut to Kosti's tent, where the general is dying now after touching this mysterious thing. A soldier opens the curtain. Oh, it's a woman, and she's dying. So, of course, kindly, the soldiers uh, bury her in an iron casket for 300 years. As apparently happens all the time in Russia, someone digs it up, and there's a huge explosion, and a skeleton pops out. The sun, so bright, so warm, yes, uh, and enjoys the sunshine. So apparently, uh, this immortal person is then captured, and turns out she's sort of a 30-year-old woman, and then she dies every month. So there's no Freudian stuff happening here at all. She's understandably angry, but apparently after 300 years, she's also crazy. So they brainwash her and Stalin says, we'll unleash her upon all our enemies. Yeah. Busty the Deathless. Yeah. And again, another cool new character explained very quickly, very well. Yeah. So again, another unbelievably cool backstory with a bunch of slightly freudian things going on there i was thinking that myself the i'm not sure about freudian woman, nobody knows about it i don't know about freudian but just the whole okay she's <laughs> no but like uh, she goes through this cycle every month <laughs> and once oh. once a month she gets all super powerful and 
again, it's one of those things where like they must have known what uh, this would like be compared to. Yeah, this is the feminist side of Valiant coming out. Uh. But it does make me kind of unsure of certain things. And again, it comes into the whole superpower stuff because they say one like once a month, but I'm not quite sure what that's referring to. Because oh, like during that, like during the page yeah. when we see her like disintegrate, right? You know, like we see her in the that room. Is that in real time or is it like throughout the month? Right. So like for a week, she gets to have a normal life, and then like most of the month, she's dying. Yay! And then she becomes super skeleton woman, <laughs> and then she's back to normal. So that's what I'm curious then. Like, so is that like, is that each stage there one week or something? Yeah, it's meant to be a month. So I guess it's like a week or two. Mm. Yeah, I was just wondering based on how they were saying it, like, because it sounds like it could also be that she's fine for the whole month except for one day, or and then during that day, that's when she disintegrates and turns to a skeleton. Yeah. I mean, again, we're talking about Valiant here, so it's like now and then. <laughs> Her body regenerates, and for several weeks, she can live as a normal woman. But once a month, so like, I don't know, a day, three days, whatever. It's like the worst payoff ever. You have to be buried alive for 300 years, and then you get to be a superhero for one day a month. <laughs> Yeah, but again, that's also kind of cool stuff there, though. I do wonder how an ongoing story would be with her. Yeah. Like, her enemies just have to remember to attack her, you know, when she's not super powerful. Yeah, guys, we just need to wait until, let me see. Yeah, I think it's going to be another couple of days, and then it's fine. But then again, you know, there was that the Disney series Gargoyles, and they had the worst weakness. They turn into stone? Yeah, during the day. It's like, okay, that's easy. <laughs> Just kill them when they're stone. <laughs> yeah, again, I mean, a super incredible backstory, and she pretty much turns into a badass skeleton with a sword. Yeah, it's just cool. So, and again, I'm looking forward to knowing about the other two as well. Um, they only get better from here. So, but yeah, I mean, um, oh, and yeah, and, and again, it's uh, uh, Jose Ramon Rip again. Of course. So, and it looks great. I mean, especially, as I said, he's great for like the disgusting stuff. Yeah. Like the page of her in the tent disintegrating, that's like, whoa. Of course, if there's flesh to be disintegrated, Reap is your man. Yeah, I mean, like, oh, like the bone sticking. Ah, oh, it's awful. Her ears falling off there. But it's done so well, you know? Like, if you're not looking at this thinking it's poorly drawn, you're, you're horrified by how well drawn this disgusting thing is. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty terrible stuff. They were so shocked by the revelation that their general was a woman that they sealed her in a makeshift iron casket. Nice, guys. Well, now, to be fair, you know, it wasn't a sexism thing. You know, they were afraid that she had some kind of epidemic, you know, because it would seem like she had some kind of plague or something, so it's best to lock her up. Nothing explains what happened to the meteorite. This thing was just sitting there in a tent. You're right. And as, was that something that existed in the previous? Uh, like, has that been mentioned in any other, like, Valiant story before? Not that I remember. Because that seems like a good thing to keep track of. Like, you know, maybe a new character could be made with that, or... It seems like they might have, like, they, they might have said something about what happened to that. No, no. It, <laughs> it's just out there somewhere. That's it's actually just... a really good point. <laughs> It's a, they never they never thought to like seek that thing out so they could have an army of super skeletons. Oh yeah, true. I, ah well. <laughs> no, no, it's still just sitting there in the tent. Yeah, no, but it's, it's little things like that though, and it, again, you know, as its own little story, it's fine. But that's what happens when you introduce something like this in a shared universe. Yeah, like even in a even in an alternate universe like this, though, actually. Actually, because remember, it seems like everything only changed in 1922. Like that was the big change. Right. So this, she should be existing in the normal world too. Maybe not found out, um, you know, by the Soviets in the same way. Okay. And on this note, I would say that's a nice place to wrap it up because this is going to be an issue with this storyline later on. Oh, okay. These guys at the end. 
Okay, then you know, yes, then I won't be, then I won't be spoiled. But I gotta be honest, I feel almost like I just wanna. After we're done here, <laughs> I think I'm just gonna sit down and finish reading it. <laughs> yeah, you kind of just... have to read it slowly, let it all sink in. Okay, because I'm genuinely curious, like how all this stuff happens. You have to let it sink in. It's a lot mm. to take in. Yeah, yeah, but great, awesome. This is a good um, one. Yeah, this is a good one. Yeah, I mean, and this was before, because again, you've been you've been hinting that uh, with the DMG uh, takeover, that the quality has uh, fallen. I mean, the tightness of the storylines, like this stuff, is is gone. Yeah. Ah, man, I really want to. I really want to compare, but I guess it will take a while before I get there. Yeah. Well, I mean, check out some of the nice new stuff, like Secret Weapons. Uh, oh yeah, that I want to read. That, that sounds so good. I, I love stories about like um, yeah. No, but I like I like stories about like quote unquote loser superheroes. Yeah. That like, best. Oh, sorry, you weren't you weren't good enough to go into my private army. <laughs> yeah, they're the best. It's uh, I don't know. There's something old fashioned about it, like teenage movies or whatever, but it's very fresh. Nice. Yeah, no, I'll definitely. Go. I think I actually might have it. I just um, I gotta go through my Comicsology account and see what I have because I do have a small backlog still. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe it. All right, but yeah, I mean, me reading it the first time here now, like I'm really into it. Like I said, as a Valiant fan, it's just fun seeing this, you know, bastardized version of my characters. <laughs> And I'm genuinely curious to see, again, I'm not sure how well it can wrap up, like in terms of, okay, how's the final explanations and stuff, but I'm genuinely curious to see what's gonna, you know, like what the solution will be and and also what these other characters will be like, because I believe the next one is going to be a Shadow Man issue, right? Like a Shadow Man tie-in. The next two tie-ins are going to be Shadow Man and then Archer and Armstrong. Perfect. That I'm looking forward to. Yeah. These are some of my favorite characters. Archer and Armstrong, probably my favorite. Uh, Shadow Man had a slow start, but it's slowly becoming a favorite too. I've and, heard that uh, the new series that came out was pretty good. The new series is cool, yeah. And uh, I don't know. I just think that you couldn't pick a better place to start with this. Uh, if you wanted to even, yeah. If you had a vague idea of what Valiant is about, this is one of the best things they've ever done. Nice. Definitely. All right. Well, uh, thank you uh, for joining me today, Michael. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was the 97th episode of Hardcast, detailing the first half of Divinity 3. For previous episodes, check out the links in the show notes and join us next time for Divinity 3 Part 2.